OK, today we're going to talk about the camera. Last week we talked about the actors. Now it's time to get a bit more technical. So we're going to talk about what you see on the screen. What is in the image and how does the image look? Now today most people making movies uh, use digital cameras. Uh, but even so, it's important to understand the technology of older film stock, Jiaojun, for two reasons. One, because even when you shoot using digital, you can still recreate the effects of traditional film stock. And secondly, because there are still people who use traditional film stock. Uh, just last year, the Kristen Stewart movie Spencer was shot using 35 millimeter film. So people are still doing this. Uh, the first thing to understand about traditional film is what quality of image do you want? How clear do you want the image to be? Now, some of you might think that's obvious. The, the higher definition, the more clear, the better, right? But actually studies have shown that this is not true. If you create a movie using images that are too clear, viewers will think that maybe the movie is not very high quality. Some people might even feel uh, repulsed or disgusted. The truth is that we're not used to seeing too high quality images on a movie screen. It doesn't look cinematic. It looks more like commercials or video games. It doesn't have the movie feel. So for example, when Ang Lee, Li An, uh, he made a movie called Billy Lin's Long Halftime Walk. Coincidentally, it also has Kristen Stewart in it. Um, he shot that movie using extremely high quality uh, photography uh, because he wanted, he said he wanted to make the image as real as possible. But when most people watch the movie, they just felt like it was so real that it's not realistic. Uh, so we have to choose the kind of quality of image that we want. Uh, so if you look at the sizes of the different kinds of film stock, uh, the smallest size that you usually uh, can choose is eight milliliter, uh, eight millimeters, ba midi. And this refers to how wide the image is uh, on a, a length of film. So how for each image or each frame, how wide is it? Uh, bigger than eight millimeters, you have 16 millimeters, then you have 35 millimeters, uh, which is the traditional standard. And then you can go even higher. You can go to 60 millimeters, 70 millimeter. Uh, but the bigger image on the film stock that you have, the more film that you need, right? If a canister of film can only hold so much film stock, then the bigger each image is, the fewer the total number of images you can have on the film. So 70 millimeter film creates movies that, are, that look really good, but it's very expensive because professional film stock is very expensive. Um, so regardless of what kind of film stock you choose, the movie will be projected onto the same size of screen, right? Whether we use uh, a small film stock or a large film stock, this is the size of the screen. In other words, the size of the film stock is not the size of the movie, it's the quality of the movie. Think about taking a picture and fitting it onto a computer screen, right? The bigger the file, the higher quality, but the computer screen is still the same size. Uh, so when you're talking about the size of film stock, eight millimeter is lower quality, uh, and then 35 millimeter is traditional quality, and then the bigger it is, the higher quality you get. Uh, the basic attribute of of quality that you can use to uh, determine film stock is uh, the lower the quality, the more grain, 粒子, 
you will see on the screen. So like uh, if you watch an older movie, you may feel like uh, there are like dots on the screen or like if you look closely, you can tell that the image is made up of uh, smaller dots of color. Th those are called grain. Uh, and it is also uh, something that makes a movie look cinematic. If you watch a movie that has no grain uh, in a movie theater, it feels kind of weird. It feels like you're at home watching a TV show. Uh, on the other hand, if you watch a movie that has too much grain, it may feel like it's uh, unprofessional or it's an older film. So there's a balance to choose here. Uh, how cinematic, how much like a movie do you want your movie to feel? Film stock is also important because uh, it is traditionally one of the things that help you determine color. In traditional filmmaking, color is determined by the kind of chemicals that are put on the film stock to capture light and the kind of chemicals you use to develop the film into pictures. Uh, of course, today uh, it's all done digitally, but the basic logic is the same. You can also choose different basic settings on a digital camera uh, in terms of color. Uh, in Chinese, we call this, I think, bai di or something. Like, the, what is the standard uh, balance of color that you want to start with? And then you can adjust uh, depending on the details later as you are processing the film. But if you choose to change your color settings from the film, uh, it has an overall impact. So like if you take a digital file and you apply a kind of color filter onto it, it changes the entire movie or the entire sequence uh, of the film that you are processing. Uh, in other words, if you want this scene to have like a blue kind of color, but the next scene to have an orange kind of color, the difference can be very big. Uh, and so the viewer might feel like this is unnatural. They might be reminded that they are watching a movie, which is something that we don't want to happen. Uh, we want to help the viewer achieve what's known as a suspension of disbelief, which means they temporarily agree to ignore the fact that it's a movie and it's not real life. Um, so another way to adjust color is when you're actually shooting the movie, you can change the color of your lighting. Uh, especially if you're making a movie indoors, most of your light will be artificial light. You'll have to like carry lights or like shine lights onto what you're shooting. Uh, at this point, you can add uh, filters onto the light itself to change the color of the light. This gives you more control over the color because it only affects the color of whatever the light is shining on. Everything else uh, will still have a basic uh, standard color. So when you watch a movie, you can actually tell whether the color was done during the shooting of the movie or afterwards on a computer. You, there, the difference is very obvious if you know what to look for. Uh, so how do you use color in a film? What kind of basic color do you want? Uh, and how does it make the audience feel about your story? In the old days, of course, it was all black and white. You don't have this worry. Um, some people say that this is why black and white films actually look more realistic. If each of us perceives color in a different way, then watching a color film forces us to use the color of the film, of the movie. But if we watch a black and white film, our minds will apply the color that we are used to seeing in daily life. So even today, there are still people who make movies in black and white for this reason. But if you make a color movie, then you have to choose. You have to think about the use of your color. Um, many, many, many movies today have a, a dual color scheme. It will either be very blue and a little orange, 
or very orange and a little blue. And this is because the science tells us that uh, human eyes perceive these two different colors the strongest on a, a screen. So like if your black, if your background is blue and something orange appears, the orange will be very obvious. On the other hand, if your background is orange and something blue appears, the blue will also may have a strong contrast. Uh, but this means that many, uh, especially like popular movies today, only use the two same basic colors and that gets boring very quickly. If you watch some older films, especially at the beginning of the color era, when color movies first started being made, you might be amazed at how many different colors are used on the screen. Uh, especially like compared with daily life. In daily life, like actually, if you think about it, when we're moving around indoors, the range of color is not very broad. Uh, most indoors are like kind of white or off white or yellow white or orange white, some kind of white. So that if you really uh, increase the dynamic range of colors on screen, it can look even better than in real life. And that helps you to give a sense of fantasy and romance to your movie. On the other hand, if you want to make like a more realistic movie or even like a dark, like a um, brooding, nor kind of uh, negative feelings kind of movie, you can choose a darker standard color. Maybe you have more blacks, more grays, more blues. Uh, and you want you would want to avoid the brighter colors uh, like orange and like bright red and bright green. Uh, but even in between these two, you can sometimes uh, change it a little for a maximum effect. For example, if you've seen the movie Schindler's List, Schindler's List, Ming Dan, most of it is in black and white, except for that one little girl wearing a red coat. And because it's the only point of color in the whole movie, the audience is automatically directed to focus on that little girl. And we care about that little girl uh, more than we care about the other characters. Uh, so the general use of color can help to set the tone or the feeling of the entire movie. The specific use of color can be used to help direct the audience attention and feelings toward a specific person or thing. Uh, and when you do choose a color for your film, remember that it has to mix well with the clothing and the makeup and all of the other physical parts of movie making. Uh, like you don't want to have someone uh, like wearing something blue and light blue and then your color setting is completely dark and you can't see the clothing. That uh, would not be a good effect. Uh, so now that we're talking about the physical process of shooting the movie, uh, we can finally get into how to use the camera. We've been talking about the image and the color, but how do you use the camera? When making a movie, it's very, very important to remember. You're not seeing everything all at once. You are seeing what the camera shows you the camera limits what you can see. It chooses what you can see for you. So if you set up a scene, like in a room with characters and furniture, you also have to plan, where do you put the camera? How do you let the camera see everything that you need it to see? For example, if I walk into a room, uh, you may not notice uh, what you do when you walk into a room, but usually you will look around and see what's going on. So you don't notice everything at once. There is a process. There is a there is a a kind of uh, narrative. Now, usually movie cameras are more limited than the human eye, so you need to plan this even more carefully. If you want the camera to follow a character into a room. What do you look at first? What do you look at 
last or even not at all. What is important to show the viewer and what is not important so you can leave it out? Or maybe there's something that you want to hide from the viewer. This is something that horror movies love to do very much. You will see a character will walk into a room, but the camera doesn't follow the character. The camera is in front of the character, and you see how the character reacts to what they see, but you don't see it. So if you, in a horror movie, if the camera sees a character walk into a room and they suddenly become very scared, you don't know why they're scared. And that makes you also very scared. So where you put the camera can have a very big effect. Now, uh, because you have to think about camera placement, you also have to think about leaving room for the camera. For professional filmmakers, a professional movie camera is huge. Like these are big things that you have to carry on your shoulders. It's hard to move with a camera. Uh, so when you're making a, if you're making a professional movie, you really have to plan to leave room for the camera. Uh, even if you're using just your iPhone, uh, you have to leave space for somebody to be able to get to that place to get the image. Uh, for example, Ryan Reynolds once made a movie called Buried. I think in Chinese it's called Huo Mai. The idea is he's buried alive, but before he dies, he tries to call for help using his phone. There are many shots in that movie of the inside of his box where he's buried. But of course, if you build an actual box and you put someone in there, there's no room for the camera. So what they did is they built five or six different boxes and each box could be opened up from a different side and the camera could be put on that side. So if they wanted a shot from the left, they would use the box that is open on the left and put the camera there. If they wanted a shot from the top, they would use a box with no top and put the camera on top. You have to think about room for the camera. Um, another very interesting um, example of this in the movie Children of Men, there is a shot, there's a very long shot, a moving shot of four people sitting in a car and the car is driving on the road. Now, the car only has four seats and yet the camera is able to turn around and get an image of all four people. So where did they put the camera? And the answer is they built a special car where the doors can be removed and the chairs can be moved while the car is moving. And so every time you see one person, uh, the seat where the other person should be has shifted and the camera has moved there instead. Uh, this is what we call an impossible shot, which is if whatever is happening on screen is actually happening, it should be impossible to put to put a camera there. Uh, nowadays, sometimes you will have you will do impossible shots by um, dividing the scene in two halves. First, you shoot this half, and then you have the actors do it again, and then you shoot that half, and you put the two halves together using a computer. Uh, that's sometimes how they do it these days. Uh, like for example, um, Nicolas Cage once did a movie called Adaptation. And in that movie, he's playing two people, two identical twins, Shuangbaotai, who live together and they talk to each other and they, and they sometimes even fight with each other, like physical fighting. So to do that, of course, first they do the scene with Nicolas Cage in one uh, space, acting with a stand-in actor. And then we, you do the scene over again where Nicolas Cage is in the other half of the scene. And using a computer, they put those two together. Uh, so when you're thinking about how much can the camera see and where do you put the camera, how do you move the camera, this also affects how do you design the scene itself? How do you design uh, the way the actors move? How do you design where you put your objects? Uh, this is a bit different from something like home design, 
like uh, Zhuang Huang. And the difference is that if you're designing a home, you want to design it to be uh, beautiful and useful no matter how you use the space, right? If you're in a house, you don't just walk in one direction. You use the space in many different ways. But when you're designing a film set or a film location, you only have to focus on where the camera goes and where the camera looks. Uh, so some like, for example, if you remember the first week we saw the movie Day for Night, uh, and in the beginning, they're shooting this big scene in like a uh, in a city and like people are walking around. There's cars everywhere, right? Uh, but if you notice, the director only gave instructions when uh, to people and cars that are in the view of the camera. Everybody else in the background who are walking around uh, and the camera can't see them, the director doesn't care. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but at the end of the movie, the entire movie, uh, we had a big shot of this uh, set from the sky. And uh, I know the credits were rolling. There were a lot of words on the screen. But if you look closely, you'll realize that all of those buildings and shops, those were fake. Those were all cardboard. And you can see the back uh, of the huge cardboard sets. But again, you don't need to care because the camera would never see that when they're actually making the movie. So like when you if you if especially if you're shooting a movie indoors and you have like a smaller kind of space. Uh, if you remember Twilight, we when we first saw Bella's uh, bedroom, I mentioned that the image seems to be a bit off balance. And one reason might be because the room was too small for the camera and they just had to put the camera wherever it would fit. Uh, that if that were if that's true, if that's the true reason, then that is one example of poor design for a movie. The house may have been very good, but it's not good for a movie. Now, uh, you there are also some things to think about, even if you don't move the camera. So if you're shooting a scene and you have decided where to put the camera, you have decided where to put the people and everything else, there is still one more thing to, to uh, think about, which is how much of the image do you want the camera to capture? How much do you want to be able to fit into the image? This has to do with uh, very technical photography things like aperture, kaikou, focus, zhaozhu things like that. The basic idea is you draw a triangle. The bigger the triangle, the more light comes into the camera, but uh, the shorter the triangle will be. Uh, and the triangle is the range of image that you can fit into the camera, into the, into the, the scene. So for a camera that has a wide aperture, a very big, a wide triangle, but a short focus. Uh, this means that uh, you can capture more things like wider into the same image, but if the, the parts of the image are too far back uh, in this direction, the audience will not be able to clearly see the things that are in the back. There's a bigger difference between front and back, but you can get more things horizontally shaping. It, does that make sense? On the other hand, uh, if you have a, a long focus camera, that usually means the triangle is more narrow, but it's longer. So there's less difference from front to back, uh, whereas you don't get as much information from side to side. Uh, and usually this, the long lens also give you an effect of, uh, since there's little difference between front to back, uh, if you watch movies where they shoot somebody from very, very far away and they're walking towards the camera, you can't tell how fast they're going because there's very little difference between front to back. Uh, so for example, in the classic movie, The Graduate, uh, at the end of the movie, Dustin Hoffman is running toward the camera. 
but they use a long focused lens in order to make us feel like no matter how hard he's running, he doesn't make any progress toward his goal. It's like he's stuck there in the image. On the other hand, if you want an example of a uh, short focus wide camera, a recent example is the film uh, The Favorite starring Emma Thompson? No, Emma, em Emma Stone and Olivia Coleman and Rachel Wise. Uh, in that movie, they actually used the widest possible camera uh, opening, uh, which, which is known as a fisheye lens, Ri and Jingto. So that uh, if you put this camera in the corner of the room, you can capture the entire room. However, the downside is that at the edges of the image, it's no longer a square. It's more like an oval, like a ren. So it's a fish eye. Uh, and the director chose this kind of lens, first of all, because he did feel like it's important for people to see the entire room. And second, because he wanted the audience to feel like they're looking at characters that are stuck in a kind of situation like a fish stuck in a bowl. Like uh, we're looking at these kind of animals uh, working out their problems in this small confined at uh, environment. So that's also an artistic choice. Uh, but remember that the more information you, you capture in the same image, uh, the more you have to think about what is in the back of the image. Is it important? Do I want my audience to be able to see that as well? Um, professional movie cameras, because uh, directors want this level of control, they don't have autofocus. So like if you take your, your phone and you take a picture, the phone will automatically find the correct focus length to make sure that the picture look, looks clear. But a professional film camera does not. So you, if you use a professional film camera, you have to measure how far away is the thing that you want to capture and then manually adjust the focus so that the thing is in focus and it looks clear and sharp. Uh, this gives you the freedom to shoot things that are out of focus, that are not clear. Uh, sometimes you do this to emphasize that attention is not here, but it's somewhere else. If you remember in Twilight, there's one scene where Bella is looking at Edward far away, and then Mike sticks his head into her field of vision, but she's not focused on him, so he's out of focus. Uh, another use of out of focus imagery is to do what's known as soft focus. Uh, you deliberately make an actor look slightly out of focus so that their face looks slightly blurrier. You can't see the clear lines and it's supposed to, first of all, it's supposed to make them look more beautiful. But secondly, it it shows that the person looking at this image is in a romantic or emotional mood. Uh, sort of like their, the, their focus is not entirely on the image, uh, maybe they're feeling what's happening. Maybe they're thinking about what's happening. Uh, so soft focus used to be used a lot in romantic movies. Like uh, everybody looks clear and sharp, but at the moment before the man and woman are going to kiss and the man looks at the woman, the shot of the woman is in soft focus to show that he's kind of like being overwhelmed by emotions or something like that. Uh, I noticed recently that on TV, like if you watch the late night talk shows or news programs, they will sometimes use soft focus uh, to sort of make the host look a little bit better. Um, as I mentioned, TV makeup is traditionally very clunky and not glamorous. But as TV cameras have gotten better and better, the makeup sometimes doesn't look quite right. So at that time, uh, the the camera person will sometimes use a little bit of soft focus to hide uh, these uh, awkward makeup lines. Uh, so if you use your phone to shoot a movie, uh, see if you can download an app that lets you manually adjust things like lighting and focus. And you can have 
more options for how you want to shoot what you whatever you're shooting. I'm sure you've all had that experience. You want to you want to shoot a, a, a photo of something that is in the dark. But the background is too bright and you have to focus on the thing and then focus on the background and then focus on the thing to try to get the lighting just right. If you turn off autofocus, you can uh, and auto lighting, you can adjust that yourself before taking uh, the picture so that you can decide everything beforehand and you don't have to struggle with uh, automatic technology. Uh, let's see if I've forgotten anything. Camera direction. Yes, and then uh, so this is the technical side of using the camera, but there's also a subjective side, which is why are you moving the camera like this? Why are you putting the camera here and not there? Uh, many people think that you should choose the most beautiful image. If you have a scene over here and you want to capture it, you should choose the best angle. That's not always true. It is often true, but it's not always true. But usually you want to think about what is the camera representing? Is it supposed to be from the perspective of one character? Or is it the perspective of the audience? Like pretending there's another person in the room and the name of that person is the camera. Or it, is it trying to give us a so-called God's eye view, an objective view of what's going on? So for example, if you focus very closely on an actor's face, that tells the viewer that we're uh, that they should try to focus, try to understand what the character is thinking and feeling. If you shoot the same actor from far away, that tells the viewer that uh, we want to care about what happens to the actor or to the character, but not care as much about what the character will do. It's more passive, more objective, like a science project, like you're looking at ants, Mai. Uh, if you shoot something from below, uh, you're telling the viewer that this person who looks taller in this moment feels powerful or has power. If you're shooting from high and you make the character look smaller, you're telling the audience that um, in this moment they feel depressed, dejected, powerless, frustrated. All of these uh, can help you decide how you want to use the camera. Another thing to think about, do you want to move the camera or do you want to have two shots and then put them together using editing. Uh, and that depends on, again, what is your camera representing? If it's representing a person uh, in that specific situation, then it would make more sense to move the camera as if the person is turning their head. But if it's simply to give the viewer information, then it might make more sense to cut between images so that the viewer can more efficiently get the information uh, that you want to give them. Uh, so all of what we've been talking about fall under the name of cinematography. So the, the quality of image, the color of the image, the composition of each individual shot, uh, and how to get from one shot to the next shot. Is it by moving the camera or by uh, adding a cut? Uh, again, the director is participating in every part of movie making, but the cinematographer is the person with the knowledge and experience to produce what the director wants. The director might say, in this scene, I want the audience to follow this person and I want to give the audience this kind of feeling. And then the cinematographer might go back and, and research the scene, think about the camera, and they will come back and give the director a kind of plan. And then they would discuss whether this is exactly what the director wanted or not. Uh, so when you're making your own movie, uh, like people don't usually start off as directors. Usually people do some other part of filmmaking and then slowly move into directing. 
So some directors start off as actors, and so they really know how to adjust the performance of their own actors. Some directors start off as cinematographers, and so they have a better idea of how to create the image that they want to create. Some directors start off as writers, so they have a, a clear idea about the bigger picture of the, the overall film. Each director has their own strengths and weaknesses, uh, and so every director depends on the professionals that help to make the film. Uh, so like when every week I'm standing here, I'm talking to you about these different aspects of filmmaking, and then we watch a movie that I hope uh, will show you how to use these aspects. But of course, every movie has every aspect. Uh, last week we watched a movie about acting, but there was also the use of camera. There was also the use of color. Uh, there was also the use of um, sound that we're going to be talking about in two weeks. Uh, so when you watch a movie, you can focus on what I'm telling you this week, but you can also think about the other parts as well. I'm hoping that by giving a more theoretical lecture and then showing you lots of movies, that I can give you ideas that you can use for your final project. So like, it's of course, it's fun to watch a lot of movies, but hopefully by watching these movies, you can also get a better idea of how to think about movies and how to make your own movie. OK, do you have questions about the camera and image? OK, so today we're going to be watching a thriller. In Chinese, this is called Jing Song Pian. Uh, but a thriller does not have to be scary. Jing Song is not Jing Xia, right? Jing Song just means you're excited, you feel suspense, you feel tension, uh, but you may not be scared. Uh, coincidentally, though, today's movie will sometimes be a little scary uh, because, like, tension and fear are very close to each other. It's easy to get from one to the other. Uh, but the purpose of a thriller is not to scare you, the purpose of a thriller is to make you feel excited. Uh, and being excited is an emotion that can be very powerful and that a uh, movie can manipulate and twist to different kinds of effects. Sometimes, or I guess most of the time, when, when a movie makes you feel excited, it's in order to get you to want to pay attention, to make you want to continue watching the movie. But there are also movies that make you excited uh, in order to make you anxious about what might happen next. There are some movies where the more you watch, the more you're like, oh my God, this will not end well. This does not have a happy ending. But that's also a kind of excitement. So a thriller is the kind of movie that uses the viewer's excitement. So of course, it has to create that excitement. And the, the most effective way to create excitement is with speed. Things happen fast. And if things don't happen fast, you can make them look fast by editing, cutting through many different images, uh, cutting out the middle boring parts and shoving everything together so that the movie moves faster. A thriller also creates suspense uh, using the elements of the story, the writing. Uh, it Sometimes it will only give the audience enough information to understand what is happening now and what will happen in a few minutes. But usually, or, or often in a thriller, only when you get to the end will you fully understand everything that just happened. The lack of information can make the movie feel like a hunt or an adventure. And that also creates excitement. Uh, but you can also hold back information, not from the writing, but from filmmaking elements. So we talked about how you can use the camera to hide information. You can use special effects to hide information. You can use acting to hide information. For example, if you have a character who thinks that they know what's going on, 
but actually they're missing some key parts. And if you follow that character through the story, that is also hiding information. And when that information jumps out, it can also be very exciting. Uh, so the key to a thriller, no matter how it creates uh, this effect, is to make the viewer feel excited. There are a few different kinds of thriller depending on how they create the excitement. There's a political thriller where the story is focused on politics and politics can be very exciting because you don't know what people will do for power. For a very ambitious people who want to have more and more power, you don't know what their limits are. Uh, and so the bad guys and sometimes even the good guys will do crazy things and that can be exciting. Another kind is the psychological thriller. And the excitement in this kind of movie is you don't know what kind of person this is and therefore you don't know what they will do. Uh, think about things like uh, movies like The Silence of the Lambs, Temur Gaoyang, is classified as a psychological thriller because the criminals are uh, serial killer cannibals, and you don't understand these people, and so you don't know what they will do. Um, today, we're going to watch uh, uh, what's known as a monster movie. So yes, there's a monster in the movie. And that also is a kind of thriller because uh, animals we kind of understand, right? Cats, dogs, you, maybe you don't understand your cat, uh, but you get you understand your cat more than you would understand like uh, a monster that is completely from fantasy or like an alien. Uh, you don't know their environment. You don't know what they're thinking. You don't know how they will defend themselves or even attack uh, people, the less you understand about a monster, the more exciting it can be. Uh, so today's movie is called Underwater. So you can kind of see where the excitement will come from. Right, you're in the water, you can't see very far, you're limited by your equipment, like your diving equipment, your breathing equipment. And I just told you there's a monster. Now, uh, usually this kind of movie is sometimes called a B movie or in Chinese, a uh, pian, because uh, traditionally uh, filmmakers who care about the movies as a kind of art form have not really thought of these movies as art. Now today, the, the idea has been changing. Even within uh, these B movies that have things like monsters and uh, killers and fear and terror, you can still do things that are insightful and artistic and make the viewer think about new things, see new things, feel new things. So even B pictures can be art. On the other hand, there are still lots of B pictures that are not art. Uh, you guys remember Bruce Willis? He's the star of Armageddon. Uh, uh, he has been making like six movies a year. They're all so-called action movies where somebody holds a gun and shoots other people. That's not art. Uh, that's just a classic genre picture or a B picture, a B movie. Um, but today I think Personally, I think Underwater is good enough of a genre picture to approach the limit, the boundary of art. Maybe in some moments it is like art. I don't know. That's up for, uh, I guess, everyone to decide for themselves. Uh, so that's what we're going to be watching uh, next period. Questions? Questions about the thriller movie? OK, uh, I just want to remind everyone that 40% of your grade depends on your final project. You can wait until week 10 for me to divide you into groups. Or you can uh, take whatever pro uh, ideas that you already have. Uh, and write a proposal. It does not have to be 
a clear and complete proposal. You can just take whatever idea you have at the moment, uh, think about how many people you need and put it up here for your classmates to decide whether they want to join you. Uh, the faster you can begin the process, the more time you have to make the movie. Uh, I also want to remind you that week 16, we will watch a movie that you choose. Therefore, you have to choose a movie. Uh, so if you have a, a movie that you want to watch with the rest of the class, and then maybe afterwards, if there's time, we can talk about it. Uh, go here. Uh, tell me what movies you have in mind. Has to be within 140 minutes. I have to be able to find Chinese subtitles, or it should be in Chinese, either one, or silent. Uh, if nobody uh, offers ideas for movies to watch before week 14, I choose the movie. Uh, I'm going to choose a movie you have never seen before. I'm going to choose a movie that will give you a totally new perspective on what is a movie. Uh, depending on what kind of person you are, maybe that, that interests you, maybe that bores you. Either way, if you want to choose for yourself, uh, nominate the movies that you want to watch. The, you know, the basic rules are like no pornography, like no too, nothing too violent, uh, things like that. Um, you can choose a scary movie if you want. I personally don't like scary movies very much, but I will watch it for you. OK, uh, so let's take a short break. Uh, let's take a 15 minute break. Come back after the second bell. <laughs> 